The Tempest is the last play identified with Shakespeare. It was first performed about 1611. There may have been a second performance in 1613. No scripts of these earlier performances are known to exist. It was published for the first time as the first play in the great folio of 1623. The basic description of the play is that it is considered a comedy. It is a comedy because it has a happy ending. The second point that has been advanced is that it is a court play. That is the type of production that was performed either under the patronage of some powerful noble or at some event in the court of England. To study the play very carefully is utterly beyond the time at our disposal. But I suggest that those of you who are stimulated by our remarks will do well to read the play at your leisure. And many have declared it by far the finest example of the theatrical literature of the period. Unlike most of the plays that came along in the Elizabethan era, it is not based upon other written material. It is not derived from the French or the Italian or the English. It is a play contrived entirely uh, within the fabric of itself. Part of the play is in the form of a prologue. This is not seen on the stage, but is referred to and filled in by dialogue as the story unfolds. The simple story of the Tempest is that Prospero, the Duke of Milan, was a very scholarly and thoughtful man who gave his life up largely to pursuit of learning and to the advancement of his own inner life. His brother Antonio, therefore, gains large authority and to him is assigned most of the responsibilities and duties of state. Antonio was highly ambitious, and he contrived to take over the dukedom. He did this uh, by eliminating uh, the duke, the rightful duke, and his infant daughter. Not wishing to be guilty of their death, he caused them to be put into a small, unseaworthy boat and turned loose upon the ocean. By providence, they came finally to a mysterious island, an island at that time inhabited only uh, by Sycorax, a witch, and her son, Caliban. Sycorax was exiled from Algiers for black magic, and this was her place of exile. Her child, Caliban, was fathered by a demon. And this constitutes a very intriguing and unusual arrangement of things. The only other creatures of the island were spirits, nature spirits, fairies, gnomes, and so forth. The most important of these spirits was Ariel. And Ariel had been imprisoned in a pine tree by Sycorax. And there he remained until later Prospero released him. When Prospero and his daughter, then an infant, reached the shores of this island, he gradually took command of the land that had originally been ruled by the witch. As a result of this, of course, uh, he came into conflict with Caliban and uh, had considerable trouble subduing him. He was never able, however, to redeem or reform his nature, and Caliban remained a strange, monstrous creation. From some years after, until Miranda, the daughter of Prospero, had grown up, 
They lived alone in this strange environment. Prospero educated her and instructed her in many of the secrets that he had gained in his long years of research. At the time of his departure from Milan, uh, Prospero had a very wise and wonderful counselor, an ancient man called Gonzalo. This uh, wise counselor, uh, when he found that Prospero was to be put into this ship, this little boat, and cast into the sea, arranged to hide in the boat a large number of the precious volumes from the Ducal Library. These books were so important to Prospero that he said they were worth much more than his dukedom. Studying these books, educating his daughter, and, and wielding authority over Caliban, Prospero remained for a long time on the mysterious enchanted isle. In the meantime, other interesting things were happening. It seems that the Duke of Venice, a Duke of Naples, a uh, more or less nondescript character in the story, but amiable, named Alonso, was uh, returning from Tunis, where he had married his daughter to the king of Tunis. For some reason, much of, of, is made of this circumstance in the story, although it is not visually presented. It is used apparently to tie the story of the Tempest to the Aeneid of Virgil. In the Aeneid of Virgil, Aeneas, the hero, stops at Carthage, and Carthage is now Tunis. And there he uh, was closely associated with Queen Dido, whose affections he did not reciprocate. And when he left, she committed suicide. Now, it is interesting that the daughter of the king of Naples should be married to the king of Tunis, which was originally Carthage. And there are several lines thrown in for no important reason, obviously, in the second act of the Tempest, in which this point is hammered in with a tremendous amount of vitality. Now it seems that in the times that, uh, with which we are concerned, Prospero had become master of magic arts. He had also a magic cloak, which made him invisible whenever he so chose. He had a magic staff with which he could draw the circle of his enchantments. And he had his book, the precious volume of all those that he had received from Gonzalo. And at this point, the prologue ends. Now, Prospero has the enchanting ability to create illusions and delusions. And in the pursuance of his art, he contrived a method, a method of revenging himself upon Antonio. He caused a great tempest to arise and founded the ship on which Alfonso is returning from Tunis on the shores of the Enchanted Isle. This is an interesting point for the reason that it is all an illusion. It was something conjured up and when we go into the story further, we find that there was nothing wrong with the ship. Nothing happened. It was all in the minds. It was all in the experiences of those who were caught in the magic tempest. It is interesting to point out also that in spite of having been cast into the sea, all the members of the ship's group arrived on the island without their clothing even being wet. It is all a system of magic, a, a peculiar combination of illusion and delusion. Once they had all arrived on the island, uh, Prospero divided them into groups, and he called upon an airy spirit called Ariel to act as his messenger. And through Ariel, he controlled, bewitched, befuddled, and bemused all these groups so that uh, 
They did not know what they were doing or really where they were. At the same time, with the king of Naples came his son, Ferdinand, an upright and fine young man. And Prospero contrived a romance between Miranda and Ferdinand. And this romance blossomed, and they were finally married, and according to the theory, at least, lived happily ever after. As time went on, uh, the uh, tone of Prospero's thinking changed considerably. And after giving all these strange experiences to these groups, he revealed his true identity as the Duke of Milan. He forgave all of his enemies, and together they returned on the ship to which nothing had really happened, and uh, the Duke, the two dukes returned to their dukedoms, and all the other members of the uh, cast faded from sight. After he left, the island was inhabited only by Ariel and Caliban. Now, this is a, a rather quick digest. We don't go into some of the lesser characters, but this is the main theme of the story. And from the time it was written, experts, scholars, students on various subjects have tried to understand it. Nearly everyone who has approached it realizes that it has more than one meaning, that it represents some type of an enigma, an emblemata, a strange and mysterious piece of literature. Those who uh, like to assume that Shakespeare wrote it are mostly inclined to admit that other pens were in there somewhere. This is understandable if there were ten years between the last presentation of the play and its appearance on the folio. Where was it during that time? We know that from the quartos of the Shakespeare plays, these quartos show revisions all the way through. And the original quartos are not like the text that appears in the first folio edition. Was this play also tampered with? Were things introduced into it that were not originally in the court play itself? Now, as we approach the subject, we realize that there are two immediate interpretations possible. The first is that the entire play deals with the theater. The uh, fact that many of these plays involve the theater and make certain philosophical opinions about, the, about theater it causes the scholar to give a moment's pause. For instance, the lines, the world's a stage, and men and women only actors on it. They have their exits and their entrances, and each one in his day plays many parts. Now, this is theater, but it is something more than that. It implies the theater of the world. In Hamlet, we find the Prince of Denmark remarking, the plays the thing with which I'll catch the conscience of the king. Play acting within play is not uncommon to the literature and theater of that period. Now, if we wish to assume that it is a play, and a play only, then nearly everything in it is explainable in terms of a kind of natural magic, which is called stagecraft. Of course, it is obvious that in the first scene where the ship carrying Antonio and the other members uh, from the uh, coast of Tunis, it is obvious that if this is on the stage, no ship sank. No one was thrown into the water. And no one swam ashore. No one had his clothes wet because there was no water. It was all a contrivance. It was all stage management. It was all the work of careful scenic description and fabrication. If this be the case, there is an interesting line in, uh, in The Tempest in which it is mentioned that the globe itself, the great globe itself, uh, shall be dissipated, shall be lost. 
And this globe, of course, reminds us that the principal theater in which the Shakespearean plays were produced was the globe theater. So now we have a globe that could either be the earth or the theater. If we wish to assume it to be the theater for a moment, then we understand why the whole subject, the whole play, is an insubstantial fabric of a vision. That it represents a dramatization in which various characteristics of human nature are carefully discussed, unfolded, and given their proper emblematic place in a very unusual plot setting. This also brings us to the next situation that we have to consider. Presuming that it is not merely a play uh, be tied to theater, then there might be other possibilities. We know that originally theater was sacred, that it was part of the great cult of Dionysus, and that within the fabric of the theater were produced the initiational rituals of these particular rites. We know also that all this pageantry was keyed to meaning, that every figure in the story had some part in the great story of human unfoldment, that it was not simply a fictional thing, but a kind of mandala suitable to meditation. And this is certainly true of the Tempest. Now, the next possible interpretation must cause us to pause for a moment and orient the play in time and place. These are very important factors for every thing that descends to us from antiquity is in some way bounded by time and place. Here we have, for example, the problem of what was the tempest that might possibly have brought this whole pic uh, picture into focus. Several have decided that the most likely answer to this is that the tempest was the Protestant Reformation. Now this was a tempest that swept Europe. It originated with the uh, development and uh, re release brought about in religion by Martin Luther. It is very interesting, just in passing, that the crest of Martin Luther was a rose, within the rose a heart, and within the heart a cross. This, incidentally, was the device of the Tudor family, not German, and on the casket of Queen Elizabeth, the symbol of the Tudor rose is identical with that of Luther's crest. This rose also occurs in many different forms and values and has been gradually linked with the idea of Rosicrucianism. There was something happening back there that was causing a considerable stir. Now, the Protestant Reformation was really the dividing line between medievalism and the modern world. By means of this reformation, the power of the clergy and of the nobility was sharply curtailed. This is the key to a great deal of our story. The Protestant Reformation liberated the possibility of the individual developing a new point of view concerning the world in which he lived and his relations with his fellow human beings. Probably the greatest product of this Reformation, if he, which is uh, clearly indicated, is Bacon's Novum Organum. Bacon has been declared to be, in a sense, the founder of the modern world, in the sense that he was the one who brought together all of the wisdom available to him and fashioned it into a new system of human thought. This, human, this, this new system was substance in substance merely the fact of bringing the philosophies, religions, and sciences of man into harmony with the religions, philosophies, and sciences of God. 
It was the first effort uh, to impose the laws of the universe upon the conduct of individuals. It resulted in a tremendous change in education. It was gradual, and it was bitterly opposed. Every leader in this particular field was under very heavy persecution. Entrenched attitudes, the power of the clergy, the dictatorial authority of the kings, these were all threatened, and naturally they retaliated in kind. They turned England into a battlefield, not a physical warfare primarily, although revolution did follow, but a battlefield of ideas, of prejudices, of, of superstitions, of attitudes, of convictions. This, while it did not appear very powerfully in the works on traditional history, was known definitely to have occurred. Now, in this particular situation, therefore, the playwrights came under evil times. When Puritanism took over in England, after the execution of Charles I, all theaters were closed. Uh, actors were forbidden to perform and were persecuted as individuals. It is said to have been a prologue and the beginning of this situation that contributed to the resolution of Shakespeare to leave London and go back to Stratford. In those days, the journey from London to Stratford was so long and difficult that it pr pr promised practical immunity uh, from the uh, pressures of political change. In this particular phase of the matter, then, we have the dawning of a new era. We have a new power rising up, a, peer, a, peer, a power of liberation, liberation, of humanism, and of transformation. Now, as we know today, we are in a similar critical period, a period in which factionism becomes intense, a period in which clinging to the old and attempting to escape to the new may often become blood, a mass of bloodshed. We are in such a critical moment as was there nearly four centuries ago, when the Protestant Reformation really swept away the divine right of kings. This change, as in the present time, was really a tempest. We are in a tempest now, right here in our own world. We are in storms which are both natural and man-made, climate, weather, combines and conspires. Earthquakes shake the earth. This is indeed a time of great confusion. A somewhat smaller but somewhat equivalent condition existed in England at the beginning of the 17th century. At that time, the great conflict to cling to the old or to go to the new was a dominant factor. We know the universities were opposed bitterly to change. So was the clergy. And the conflict between the Church of Rome and the Church of England was intense. It was a time of great strife, but in it was the seed of a new way of life. This seed appears in the tempest in the words of the old counselor Gonzalo. He describes a new way of life a new world, a new concept of existence, in which there should be no war, no crime, no tyranny, that the individual would not be burdened with the labors of peasantry beyond his natural control, that man should return to the contemplation of nature, that he should therefore realize that he has been given a world that can support him and take care of him, and give him all the needs and many of the luxuries of life, if he will cease his competitions, if he will overcome his arrogance, and will dominate for a little while at least his instinct uh, to advantage and ambition. In other words, Gonzalo states the very basic story, uh, which has also been associated with Bacon's New Atlantis, and in turn with the shipwreck of 
uh, Sir George Soma uh, on the Bermudas. All these things were part of a picture that dominated the minds of people at that particular time. It was obvious that such a concept could not be put on the stage. It would have been enough to condemn to death anyone who would outwardly and frankly discuss the matter. Everything had to be done in secret. Now, in this particular case of secrecy, we discover, for instance, that Prospero, in the story, has three priceless instruments which he values, but which in the end he casts aside. The first of these is his magic cloak. He wears this before the world all the time. But when in talking to his daughter Miranda and in other intimate uh, details, the stage instructions tells that he takes off his cloak. The second thing that he has is a magic staff with which he draws the circle of his enchantments. And the third thing he has is a great book which contains all the secrets of the world. Now, if we uh, say, for example, that Prospero represents the new order and perhaps veils the personality of Bacon himself, then we can begin to understand the magic cloak, which he takes off and puts on. When Prospero wore it, he could make himself invisible at will. When he took it off, he was visible again. Now, we can uh, rather equate this with the idea that a great part of the work of the, this new order of things was done in secret. Many books were written without names. They were cloaked. They were concealed. In other occasions, uh, we find that the magic cloak allowed him to move invisibly in a world of his own, a world of secrecy. For well, that is the real meaning of the magic cloak, secrecy. Now he had a staff, and this is very cute, and most people probably haven't even thought of it. What is a staff? It is a stick you lean on. No one questions this. But a staff is also an establishment of people working towards a common end. We have the post office department with its staff. We have the police department with its staff. The staff becomes a symbol also of a group. Now, if we want any further inclination in this direction, we remember that with the staff, he drew his magic circle. What is a circle? A circle is also a group of people gathered together under some particular purpose for considerations and purposes considered to be important. We know that at that time there was a circle of po poets and playwrights and actors, and that these were the closest friends that Lord Bacon had. We also then come to the book, and at the end of the play, Prospero cries, and deeper than it ever plummets sound, I'll drown my book. Drowning is a symbol of concealment. So that the concealment of the book, or the placing of it where it is inaccessible, is also part of the original plot and story. Actually, now, then, we have to consider a little bit the political system and the situation it involved. The Baconian theory of philosophy and science is based upon experimentation, observation, and tradition. Bacon's outward texts emphasize all of these points. The entire theory is that man shall no longer follow the dictates of other men that he shall no longer derive his authority from the past, or from that, for that matter, even from the contemporary. The individual, the scholar, must gain his authority by observation of facts. This involves experimentation. 
laboratory techniques and everything that it is possible for the individual to learn. He also implies in this the foundation that was later to be enveloped by the cloak of the Royal Society, namely the exploration of all parts of the earth to know more about their people, to know more about their natural resources, to find out about their flora and fauna, to determine their characters and their nationalities. It was also a continual program of research into man, the circulation of the blood, uh, the development of the new concepts of astronomy by Copernicus and Galileo. All these things were part of a great pattern which had as its primary objective human improvement, but produced in the course of its development a great amount of human confusion. To finally change the basis of knowledge from tradition uh, to living fact was the great tempest, the, the transformation uh, that was so greatly to be desired. Now in this particular instance we realize from the study of Bacon's writings that they divide definitely into three groups. The first group composed of the Novum Organum and other elements and sections of the advancement of science were limited largely to the outlining of an infallible pattern for the advancement of knowledge. This is so clearly set forth that it is amazing even to our present day. The second part of his teaching was essentially philosophical. And in this area, he gives us a great many uh, interesting patterns, constant references to classical thinking, and of course his wonderful little book, The Fables of the Ancients. He shows his philosophical insight sufficiently in his outward writings to be included among the great philosophers of Europe. His third part was religion, and while it would appear uh, that a scientific advancement might result in the retarding of religion. This was no part of Bacon's plan. Bacon himself declares on a number of occasions that he is a faithful child of the Church of England. He also left to us his essays, which are among the finest moral and ethical documents and one of the greatest pieces of English literature. In uh, a less well-known category, Bacon has left us a group of prayers addressed to deity, prayers that reveal him as a humble, penitent person, seeking only the common good and desiring only to obey God. These prayers have been declared by scholars to be probably the finest religious documents of the modern world. So Bacon, by his own life, tells us something that has been generally forgotten, namely, that science and religion are not in conflict, that it is not necessary for the scientist to depart from the essential principles of religion. He may differ with man-made theology, but he will not differ from the laws of heaven. And Bacon in one place tells us uh, that uh, it is essential to realize that a little knowledge may incline men's minds to atheism, but greatness of knowledge bringeth their minds back again to God. So Bacon was a scientist, philosopher, mystic, whose entire structure was based upon the correct interpretation of the divine law as it manifests in creation. So it has been said, and with some perhaps justification, that Prospero might represent Bacon himself, his objectives, his purposes, and the strange skills that he exhibited. It has also been suggested that Prospero is the new philosophy that he is a personification of 
the intellectual reformation that resulted in the rise of modern scholarship. It has also been suggested, perhaps with equal uh, integration, that he personifies the hierophant of the ancient mystery system of Greece, the master of the play. He is the one who moves all the creatures and all the peoples of the story. He arranges them playing as they were checker parts, or moved as chess men upon a board of nights and days. Prospero is the stage manager. He is the one who decides when the play shall begin, when it shall end, and the part that each shall play in the production. As a stage manager, if the stage is the world, he represents, therefore, a concept of what might be termed the philosopher king. He represents the leadership of the world by the best of itself, and that this best of itself uh, shall finally come into authority. The magic of Prospero is the magic of science. There is nothing that he did that man has not excelled since his time. The miracles on the enchanted island are nothing in comparison to the miracles that have come out of the unfoldment of the scientific theory. The only thing that is the matter with the problem is that the scientist has not made the link with God, which is absolutely essential to the preservation of scientific knowledge and its proper use. All these possibilities then cause us to focus for a moment on Gonzalo. Uh, Gonzalo, the faithful friend of Prospero, is much like the Merlin of the Arthurian cycle and also uh, like the Gurnemans of Parsival. He is the sage counselor. He is the one who is called upon to transform the scientific facts into moral truths. In other words, he takes the new dimension and transforms it into a moral, ethical, philosophical subject. He points out the implications of knowledge, how each new discovery brings new opportunities, not for skill alone, but for wisdom. He is taking all truths that the Prospero has gathered and assembled and is transforming them into meaning in the lives of the common people. He is showing how not truth in its own nature uh, can transform not only the fields of learning but the fields of living. So Gonzalo is called frequently the wise sage and counselor is inevitably uh, the principle of wisdom. Now comes Miranda. Miranda is a very beautiful, a very loving, very pure young woman who has known no one but her father and Caliban and some of these uh, nature spirits. She has been taught by him and instructed by him and is his confidant. And whenever he addresses her, he takes off his cloak. Now, there's almost no doubt, and practically all have agreed, uh, that Miranda is the symbol of religion. In other words, Miranda represents the third part of a triad of the mind and the emotions and the efficiency of physical life. So in our little concept, we can remember the old Greek Socratic triad, the one, the beautiful, and the good. Obviously, Prospero is the one. Gonzalo is the good. And between them stands Miranda, the beautiful. These form a triad, which is basically Christian but is derived as much Christian mysticism is derived from very ancient sources. This triad of the one, the beautiful, and the good is clearly unfolded by Dionysus Areophagus 
in his mystical divinity. It is also found in St. Augustine's writings and particularly in the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. But in any event, we have now a triad, a triad of principles, principles that are definitely based upon eternal truths in nature. These three are very hard sometimes to fully understand, but we know that Miranda is the confidant of her father. We know that she obeys him, and she, we know also that she knows him without the magic cloak. So we find another very interesting parallel there in spirit, soul, and body. In other words, Prospero is the spirit of the new learning. Miranda is the soul of that learning. And Gonzalo is the body of that learning. And uh, it is only Miranda, the soul, that can commune with her father, the spirit, when he is not cloaked in one of his appearances. She, by her own intuition, receives his instruction, and he is always in communication with her. And the close of association of spirit and soul is very beautifully and tenderly developed. Now, in this same triad situation, we observe the instrument of Baconian Reformation. These instruments are a better, fuller, more perfect understanding of God. And the supreme cloak which conceals the true purpose of God is the world, the whole of nature, all of which is the garment of divinity. And uh, to those who are very wise and mystically inclined, those who have had illumination, perceive the fact uh, directly because they penetrate the cloak and are able to commune directly with their father. This uh, situation has many interesting possibilities for development, but it certainly lingers as one of the more probable uh, elements in the interpretation of the, of the story. Now, the other members of the cast also have their parts to play, but they are all related to the world of form. These are the three of the, that I have mentioned are the principles. The others are the manifestations of these principles through use or abuse. Antonio is the perversion of religion, perversion of knowledge. He is the one who has falsely taken the control of the universe from his brother and has assumed tyranny. Now, uh, this uh, type of thinking reminds us, of course, that Bacon was fully aware, even in his own time, of the tremendous abuses that were going to arise in the effort to unfold his teaching. He knew that the first thing the human being would do with greater knowledge is to abuse it. He realized, therefore, that it was very necessary in some way to convert his brother rather than destroy him. He had to find some way of exposing his own truth. Prospero had to prove that the spirit cannot die, cannot be completely destroyed, and that ultimately it must reveal itself to his corrupt brother. The other pack factor in the course is Ferdinand. Ferdinand it represents in the old mystery system, the candidate seeking initiation. In other words, Ferdinand is by nature an honorable person. He was the first to leap into the sea from the ship in the delusion, which indicates that he was courageous. 
he was resolved to swim across the interval and finally reach the truth. Ferdinand, naturally, and, and undoubtedly uh, with the contrivance of the stagecraft, actually becomes enamored of Miranda, who represents his own soul. He is, uh, Miranda is the uh, blessed demoiselle of Rossetti and is the wonderful, mysterious Beatrice of Dante. She represents to Ferdinand, the principle of love, the principle that love must be part of the great triad. For the problem of virtue lies in wisdom, love, and integrity. These principles bring them together, and Ferdinand becomes inevitably the bridegroom in this uh, apocalyptic fantasy. Most of the other characters have been introduced primarily for the purposes of a court mask. Uh, the uh, na the uh, sailors with their robust humor and the other individuals involved have very little real significance in the play. They are used most often to tell some part of the production that is not shown. Caliban, however, does come in with considerable force. He is described as a monster. And when uh, Prospero tries to teach him to speak, Caliban says all he has learned is to swear better. He is able to curse more grammatically. Now, Caliban obviously represents in the field of knowledge not only natural ignorance, but a kind of depravity. Caliban is materialism. He represents the power that is constantly attempting uh, to justify its own angers, hates, fears, and appetites at the expense of the new way of life the new order of learning. Caliban is the inevitable result of the increase of skill without the increase of integrity. Actually, Caliban attempts to assassinate Prospero. He attempts to destroy wisdom because wisdom is an appetite he does not know how to satisfy. He wants to destroy the thing that interferes with his right to be wrong. He wants to use all of the skills that have been part of Prospero's magic simply to advance his own animalistic tendencies. Materialism, therefore, declares war against integrity, against the new order of learning. Materialism takes the wand and the magic coat to cover its own nefarious actions. Materialism wants knowledge only for one thing, and that is personal gratification, and that is the Caliban's keynote. He is not interested in the improvement of anything except his own fortunes, and he hasn't the intelligence to do anything with his own fortunes. He is simply a blind, bestial dedication uh, to gratification. In this instance also, we have a little thought for Ariel. Now, Ariel is uh, one of the interesting characters that appear in certain of the Shakespearean plays. Puck in The Midsummer Night's Dream is another. Ariel is a spirit. His name suggests air. But there is more to him than merely atmosphere. Uh, actually, uh, Ariel represents power. He is the force, the energy, the life, the vitality uh, in things. He is the one power upon which all science, all philosophy, and all religion depend. He is also the power upon which every living creature depends for its own existence. 
He is invisible, except on occasion. He is also a little rebellious against the bondage to Prospero, and he is constantly urging for Prospero to let him free or set him loose from the control of Prospero's magic power. There we have force, and we have a modern counterpart for this situation, power. Someone once asked Steinmetz what uh, the universal principle was, and he replied instantly, power. The mysterious power, not the kind that is tyrannical, but the power that activates the power that becomes the moving and living force behind all life. He is the messenger. He carries out the orders. He is subordinate to Prospero, but he flies about the world in the twinkling of an eye and almost travels as fast as modern television or, t or these different international uh, communication media. He goes where he pleases. He can be fire in St. Elmo's fire on the masts of ships. He can do all kinds of things. He has innumerable appearances. But always, he is begging Prospero to set him free. Now, this can be given quite an interesting um, interpretation. We are now having a little trouble with our nuclear installations. We are a little afraid of them. We suspect that we are doing things that we don't understand. And what is this nuclear rebellion which is cutting down or shutting down so many of these plants? It is power seeking to be free, to do as it pleases, and man variously imprisoning it, variously directing it or misdirecting it. In the Baconian theory, power is a manifestation of the divine will. Even she, uh, Schopenhauer comes pretty close to that thought. Power is the ability that does everything. In the hands of Prospero, this power becomes his messenger, and through its use, he finally arbitrates all his differences and uh, forgives all of his enemies. Prospero uses force to set up an illusion and then uses force to overcome that illusion and restore truth. So Ariel is very difficult to portray in this play, which has led many people to the suspicion, which is probably true, that The Tempest was not primarily intended ever to be performed. It was to be read. Its general theme was certainly not within the scope of the average Elizabethan theater goer. It required a great deal more insight and care and consideration. Now to go back again uh, to some of the earlier points. Uh, the play has, I feel, an astronomical foundation also. And it is founded not upon the Copernican theory, but rather upon the ancient system of Ptolemy. For all religions of the ancient world were finally summarized in Ptolemaic astronomy. It became the skeleton on which all the different draperies of beliefs were hung. They all obeyed and agreed with this essential principle. So that it's quite possible and proper to see how this would cooperate with our general discussion. Those of you who are familiar with the geocentric system of astronomy which was the system endorsed by Ptolemy and prevalent until the 17th century, this system placed the Earth in the center of the solar system. And by the way, the solar system and its old drawings and figures makes a perfect magic island. The solar system is a magic island. It is an island floating in the sea of space. It is also an island to which many creatures, including man, have been exiled. And many philosophical works, particularly those involving the Robinsonaden or Robinson Crusoe cycle, 
show man to be a castaway upon a desert island which he must gradually transform by his own skills. In any event, in the Ptolemaic system, the earth is the center. And from the body or physical body of the earth, there are certain extending bands for the elements, the four elements of the ancients which they considered to form earth, were earth, water, fire, and air. These were the elements. And these were the constituent parts of earth as known to the ancients. Outside of these divisions were the orbits of the seven planets known to antiquity. They did not account the earth a planet. Therefore, this is following, uh, this following the Gnostic and Ptolemaic system was called the eighth sphere, the physical earth. And in the Gnostic writings, it is called the abortio. The other planets, however, are in their proper order. Above the orbit of the four elements is the orbit of the moon, above that of Mercury, from which one rises to Venus, then to the sun, after that to Mars, then to Jupiter, and finally to Saturn, who in a sense has drawn the magic circle around the solar system. Now if we uh, wish to make an astronomical parallel, therefore, we can start by simply saying uh, that Saturn is Prospero. The powers of Saturn, as discussed in various astrological writings, fully support this. Saturn in the tenth house, which is its natural home, is the ruler. He is the head of everything. He is the leader. He is the one who appoints the representatives. And unless perverted or by some bad combination, he, re he rules righteously and, uh, con and contains within himself the principles of all the other planets. Below him is Jupiter, the most philosophical of the planets in astrology. This is Gonzalo, who is uh, involved in learning. Uh, Jupiter rules higher education, all these things. He is involved in learning. He is involved in interpretation. He is involved in revelation, on unfoldment, and reformation of learning. The third one is Mars, who undoubtedly represents Antonio, because Antonio and Mars are both symbols of violence, of aggressiveness. A good uh, Mars is one of courage. A bad one is one of uh, treasons, stratagems, and spoils. A deceiver, a destroyer of good. The next is the sun in this order. And he is Ferdinand. Because Ferdinand in the ancient mysteries was always the candidate the sun. And the journey through the mysteries was always patterned by the journey of the sun through the zodiac. Therefore, the candidate played the sun. That below that is Venus, who corresponds uh, to the king of Naples, who is just returning from marrying his daughter to the king of Tunis. He is a symbol of emotional unrest. He is constantly involved in the use of emotions to advance his own temporal power by forming allegiances. Alfonso, then, is emotional disturbance and also, to most people, a symbol of the perversion of emotion for self-gratification. Below that is, of course, Mercury. And what could Mercury be better than Ariel? Mercury was the messenger of the gods. He was Prospero's messenger. He was the communicator that bound heaven and earth. He was the brilliance of the quick mind, but he was also the mysterious power of vitality. Therefore, Mercury was a kind of universal agent, perhaps the same agent that Paracelsus called Azoth, that which a man can possess it will make him able to go everywhere, be everything, and do everything within the boundaries of his philosophical understanding. 
The moon, of course, is Miranda. And here we have another very interesting symbolism. For the moon is the mother of the mysteries. She is the great Isis, whose veil no man can lift. She is the Mata Deorum, the mother of gods. And in the uh, Greek, she is Rhea. In Christianity, she is the Madonna. As in, um, therefore, she properly represents the moon. Now, there's an interesting mm -hmm. point in this that perhaps many people haven't noticed, and that is that we have a touch of alchemy thrown in on us at this point as a means of establishing something that might otherwise be difficult to understand. For in alchemy, the great, the great work is accomplished by the marriage of the sun and moon. So the happy marriage of Ferdinand and Miranda represents the philosophic union. It represents that union within consciousness itself by which all living things will dwell together in happiness forever. The Chinese have exactly the same thought in their cinnabar alchemy, for they re also refer to the medicine of the sun and moon. The union of the sun and moon is the final reconciliation. And as soon as Prospero has achieved his end in the romance between his daughter and Ferdinand, he begins to undo his magic because it becomes no longer necessary. We have all these elements, and of course in this pattern, the eighth sphere left out, the abortio, is Caliban. Uh, the uh, symbol of the lower material side of life. The Arabs had an ancient belief that all the evil in the world finally was filtered out of our atmosphere and made into the body of a dark star which circles around the orbit of the earth. Now, efforts have been made to distinguish this. Some astrologers have tried to identify it with Lilith, the de demon wife of Adam. But in any respect, it is the symbol of, of Caliban as they unregenerate, the uh, unredeemed, but to be redeemed in the due course of time. The body cannot redeem itself. It has to be redeemed by the powers within it. And when these powers do not concentrate upon that effort, Caliban remains a monster. There is a further clue to this in the fact that the material earth is supposed to be surrounded or composed of four elements. Earth, water, fire, and air. Each of these has an astrological symbol. Each of these has an emblematic symbol associated with it. And the body of Caliban is a composite made up of these symbols. He represents all the four elements in their monstrous compound, which we call the world. Now, as we think a little deeper into this thing, we come against something else that's rather confusing but intriguing, and that is the hermetic axiom. That which is above is like unto that which is below. And that which is below is like unto that which is above. This is said to have been inscribed on the emerald tablet found by Alexander the Great in the tomb of Alexander, in the tomb of Hermes. In this particular case, the law of analogy intrigues us to wonder what the relation may be between the world form the world pattern, the world intrigue, and man himself as a person. There is no doubt in the world that Bacon's primary consideration in all of his works was the improvement of man, the regeneration of the human being by providing him with facts, with realities so inevitable that he could not refute them. Man's regeneration depends upon his return to the divine plan by which he was fashioned. He must obey that which was created to command. He must be part of a plan in which principles are immutable, and the individual can never be free except by obeying. So we come now to man himself and his composite constitution, and this seems likewise to have a place 
in the story of the Tempest. Most of those who are interested in esoteric matters at all are aware of the multiple bodies of man. They are aware of the auric field in which abide the principles of life and also the seeds of the various lower vehicles which involve the lower mind, the emotions, the vitality, and the form. Here we have, therefore, <coughs> a triad of principles manifesting through a quadrad of bodies or vehicles. This is uh, very much in line. For here we find Prospero, the spirit. The spirit, the highest part of man's constitution, by which it is one with and indivisible from the universal spirit. And for all practical purposes, the spirit in man is an aspect of the universal life principle. The God in man is the fragment, so to say, of the God in space. This re relationship gives finally to the spirit ultimate authority. But the spirit is cloaked in bodies. And therefore, its direct influence upon man's conscious personality is impaired. The average individual would hardly like to promise or swear that he had a spirit. He does not know what it is. He does not know how to give allegiance to it because he cannot hear its voice directly, nor can he see it. Therefore, to man, the spirit is a mystery. It is a mystery inscribed and encircled within an enigma. Actually, however, the center section, or the second person of the Trinity in man, called in the Orient the Buddhic sheet, is partly available. For in the Greek system, the soul, or the second person, the savior principle, the redeemer, is located symbolically in the human heart. The spirit is mysteriously hidden within the deepest fastnesses of the brain, but also in the absolute circumference of the magnetic field. The God within is also the boundary of man's auric structure. Therefore, the soul now becomes the second person of the Trinity. The soul is the redeeming power. The soul is the only begotten of the Father. Miranda was Prospero's only child. And the Spirit instructs the soul in dreams, in visions, in mystical experiences, in strange magic rites which we do not understand and are apt to profane. But the soul becomes the communicating power. It is the middle distance between eternity and time. It is that which by its own nature is able to speak or know its father when he has removed his cloak. When all appearances, all circumstances, all incidents have been removed, the soul communes with its own source. The third of the great principles, the manas of India, is the mind. And the mind now is Gonzales. Now, the mind, as we study it, like all of the other bodies of which it is the highest, is stratified. There are many levels of the mind. The most common division is the division between abstract and concrete mind. Abstract mind is best perhaps represented by Gonzales because he represents thought in principles, whereas the concrete mind, which is only able uh, to see the outer semblances of things is more or less captured in the various persons that become incidental to the story, because all its labors are incidental. In the level and substance of the mind itself, in the higher realms of intellect, is the seat of what we term the self, which some call the ego. Others like to think of it as the I in us. 
this corresponds with individuality and is Ferdinand, who is the high, who has the power uh, to understand has the power to gradually unfold its own resources. In other words, Ferdinand is the personality seeking to be re-identified re with its own source. Below this we also have the various levels of emotion. We have the struggle of the abstract and concrete appetites. We have this strange problem that is so well set forth in the dialogues involving Alfonso, the king of Naples. Confusion, the effort to apply emotions to the advantage of some purpose. Anger, uh, disillusionment, conspiracy, not on the mental plane alone, but the urge to these things as emotional factors in life. Therefore, we find that man's emotional nature is torn between good and evil, between truth and error. And by emotions, he drifts towards the gratification of lower appetites or ascends to the realization of higher destiny. Below the emotional late nature, of course, is the energy body, called the etheric double by some, vital body by others, the akashic field by still others. Here we have definitely the symbolism of Ariel. Ariel can be transformed immediately into the human nervous system, just as Alfonso can be the veins, and each of the levels has its own proper representative. This uh, Ariel now is the life with which we move and ha have our being. If anything impairs that life, we have a paralysis. If it is too greatly impaired and the life supply is cut off, we have death. But life itself does not die. It continues to exist in space forever. But the vital body of man is the link between the two higher bodies and the physical form. If this link is disturbed, then sickness of various kinds steps in. And it was one of the Paracelsian axioms that most diseases originate not in the body, but are transferred to it by abnormalities in the magnetic field. But Ariel, spry and bright as he is, also vitalizes the other bodies. He vitalizes the emotions. He vitalizes the mind. But he only serves Prospero. Now, in the vitalizing of the various aspects of life, which he has as his peculiar promise, he also is trying to be free. He wants to be liberated from the control of spirit. This is an appearance rather than a fact, because he is the, actually the energy of spirit itself. Prospero tells him that in due time he will be free. Now, the free use of energy is its proper use. It is its use as a building power, a constant reminder to us all that the energy by which we do anything is the divine energy, that it is given to us for a purpose, for a dedication. We cannot lift our hand without it. But what happens when we lift our hand against our brother? This is disruption of energy. This is abuse of it. And from this abuse, numerous and innumerable tragedies result. Therefore, Prospero continually promises Ariel his ultimate freedom, but does not bestow it immediately. Because man cannot have the full control of vitality until he knows how to use it. In technical thinking, the complete control of this vital principle could end in physical immortality. Because if the flow of energy is not intercepted, or in, or in some way blocked, organs continue to function, the mind continues to dream, and all things continue to go in the direction 
which they are intending to go. Actually, as a vital principle also, uh, Ariel has another facet to his nature, and that is that he is the power of imagination. The, uh, ner I mean, imagination in some way by the ancients was linked with the nervous system, which is probably proper, but it's a combination of emotion, of thought, and of vitality. And these being combined in Ariel, we see how they can work out. Actually, as Bacon himself tells us, the whole of creation is a dream. The great problem is that man must learn to dream true. He must learn to recognize that dreams have a strange substance in them and that perhaps the most important of all dreams is the dream of a better world to come where imagination projects us into the future it provides us with the incentives to achieve that future if we live always in the very commonplace atmosphere of our own mediocrity we are afraid to dream and if we do dream we're apt to have nightmares but to dream true is to anticipate something better. And Bacon's great dream of the new Atlantis was a dreaming true. It was the building of a, vision, of a kind of architect's di diagram, something that did not yet exist in mortar and stone. But this diagram, this picture, this plan, would someday be fulfilled. And it is thus with the great dreams of mankind, our sages, our saints, our scholars, our mystics, all together. They are the ones that are dreaming of the solutions to things. And there's not enough of that dreaming today. We are all locked in the immediate. We are afraid to think of tomorrow. And we do not want to remember yesterday. But actually to look forward to something greater and something better is absolutely necessary to us. Bacon could imagine what was going to come, but he could only lay the foundations. And each of us, each nation, each individual, each generation, has to build a solid foundation under its dreams, its visions, its hopes, its dedications. It must build and count much on the substance of things unseen because it is within ourselves, in our own inner lives, that we are the architects of the world's future. So if you put all these things together and make a kind of a picture out of them, I think you can read The Tempest and get a good deal more out of it because whoever wrote it was very, very wise and had a skillful knowledge not only of the times in which he lived but of the future. He was certainly a scholar, a scientist, a philosopher, a mystic. And he also had the skill to put these factors together to form an imagery. And when the play is finished, then Prospero comes out and makes his little epilogue. The curtain goes down the scenery changes and the whole drama ends. But before it ends, the reconciliation of the conspirators, the happy union of Ferdinand and Miranda, and the fact that the ship that they thought had been sunk hadn't been sunk at all, and they all gathered on it to go back to their homelands. Each, therefore, went back to his own place, each a little wiser, each a little better, for the experience. It is called a comedy because it all ends well. And that is the comedy of life. For somehow, inside of ourselves, without, in spite of our doubts and apprehensions, there is a realization that comes to us from our own souls, planted there by the great magician of them all, God, planted there to assure us that in the end all will be well. And this is really the idealistic summation of this very extraordinary play. 
Well, I have a couple of announcements I'd like to make at this time before we all go our ways. First of all, I'd like to tell you that our friends, uh, Dr. Bode and his wife, Homai, are making a little visit here. Take a bow. Take a bow. Also, I have some more news. It's a little interesting. Maybe you've noticed it over there. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, movement of the various elements in the Tempest have resulted in a piano. <laughs> this is a very fine Steinway piano, and I am very much intrigued about it because for a long time I've wanted our programs to be stronger in creative arts. Because art history, like the story of the play, is the instrument and vehicle for the perpetuation of some of the noblest truths of life, which cannot be actually put into words. So this piano we're very happy about, and uh, you may like to know that at the time of Dr. Drake's death, a number of friends set up a memorial fund for him, and we have purchased this piano as a memorial to Dr. Drake, and it will have a proper inscription upon it and be... Uh, our testimony to our remembrance of our late Vice President. So we hope that you will all appreciate this particular point. Incidentally, uh, we now have an upright piano that isn't absolutely necessary, and uh, perhaps someone uh, would like to, you know, do something about that, might like to have it, and might like to make a donation for our work. In any event, we're very happy to have you all with us, and we'll see you soon again and we hope you will join us in future here in our little magic isle. Thank you very much. <laughs>